If you're a value investor, there's a pretty good chance you've heard of Brookfield Corporation. Bruce Flatt, its CEO, has been called Canada's Warren Buffett. The company recently purchased part of Howard Marks' company, Oakshire Capital, and it's been owned by the likes of Monish Pabrai, Chuck Aker, and others. So, the company has a pretty good reputation in value investing circles. There's just one question that stops a lot of people from investing. Why is it so complex? Brookfield is famous for having a very convoluted corporate structure. It's not just Brookfield Corp. It's also Brookfield Asset Management, Brookfield Renewable Partners, Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, Brookfield Funds. There are many, many listed Brookfield entities, and it all seems like they're in some way the same company. Now, to an extent, the claims that Brookfield is an overly complex organization have some merit. It is a holding company, meaning that on the corporate level, there is an entity that receives dividends and other income from the entities lower down the chain, and it also has many of its companies being publicly listed entities in their own right. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes from. When people think of Brookfield Renewable Partners, for example, they think, okay, is this part of Brookfield or is it some sort of fund? So, in a sense, Brookfield is more complex than many other companies are. There are plenty of companies out there that are basically just pure play exposure to one operating line of business, and Brookfield is, in fact, a lot more complex in its structure than that. However, it's not actually that complex for a holding company. Instead, it appears to be complex because of how some of its subsidiaries are publicly listed entities. If you take a look at this infographic here, you'll see that below Brookfield, the holding company, are basically four categories of entities. You have Brookfield Property Group, that is a wholly owned real estate business. You have Brookfield Reinsurance, which is a wholly owned re reinsurance subsidiary. You have various Brookfield listed partnerships, that includes the private equity business. And finally, you have a separate stake in Brookfield Asset Management. What confuses people in general tends to be these latter two segments. These are not 100% owned subsidiaries of Brookfield. They're partially owned by the public and they trade on the stock market in their own right. This is where some of the confusion comes from. However, if we really think about it for two seconds, it's not that complicated. The way to wrap your head around it is to just imagine that 25% of Brookfield asset management was not publicly traded and 25% of the listed partnerships and REITs were not publicly traded. Just imagine that Brookfield owned 100% of these entities. If that were the case, then the structure of Brookfield Corporation would be no more complicated than that of Berkshire Hathaway. It would own 100% of Brookfield Property Group, the insurance company, the partnerships, and Brookfield Asset Management. And that if you look at something like Berkshire Hathaway, well, you have Berkshire Hathaway on the top, a stock portfolio beneath it, various different operating businesses like the insurance companies and the railroad, and in a universe where Brookfield did not choose to make some of its segments publicly traded entities, Brookfield would be structured much like that. So it's not that the company has that complex of a structure, it's the fact that some of its subsidiaries are traded as stocks in their own right that causes all the confusion people experience when researching Brookfield. Another factor that somewhat complicates Brookfield as an investment is the accounting rules that it's subject to. It just so happens that Brookfield owns approximately 50 to 99% of some of these partially publicly traded entities that it controls. As a result of that, it uses an accounting method called the full consolidation method. And the way the full consolidation method works is a little bit confusing. Under full consolidation, at the start of your income statement, you will report the revenues and earnings from the company that you own, say, 75% of, as if they were 100% belonging to your company. So the income statement starts off with numbers that, from an ownership perspective, are actually fictitious. They, they don't reflect what the company actually owns. Down from that, you get non-controlling interests. You subtract that from net income to get net income available to common shareholders. And finally, you get diluted earnings per share or basic earnings from share from that. The thing you need to remember is that if you want to know what Brookfield actually owns, you look at the figures that come after 
non-controlling interest because under the full consolidation method, the company does have to report 100% of its subsidiaries uh, revenue and costs and earnings initially on its income statement. So, it's not that Brookfield is intentionally trying to confuse anyone, it's that because it owns between 50 and 99% of many of its subsidiaries, it's required to use a somewhat confusing accounting methodology. So, what do you think? Is Brookfield too confusing? Are the accounting rules that it's forced to follow reasonable? Do you think that Brookfield's management is playing accounting games in order to gin up the stock price? Let me know in the comments down below, and other than that, that's it for me. Happy saving!